Um, my name is Sarah Smith. I'm a professor of history at American River College, and today's date is May 23rd, 2023. So let's start off by establishing the basics. Uh, what's your full name? What are your pronouns? And what's your date of birth? My name is Thomas Ma Antonio Resendez. I identify with he, him, his, and my birthday is May the 11th, 2003. Um, so you're 23. But, no, I'm actually 20. 20, 20, I did math. <laughs> and you just had a birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Very belated birthday. Um, okay, so tell me a little about yourself. Uh, what are your interests and hobbies? What do you like to do? My interests, well, I like to watch Mexican movies of, of the golden era of Mexico. Uh, I have a good, I have a very well-rounded knowledge of Mexican history and also a bit of Amer Mexican American history and other history subjects as well regarding this country. As I like to build with Legos when I can, when I have the time to. I like to my, speak, talk with my friends when I can and just relax and be at home. Not that much, I, but when I but when I do feel the need to be outside, I would like I usually just go out to the backyard or just tag along and arrive with my family to whether they're well with my mother, whether she's going to the grocery store or just getting out of the house in general. Um, so where did you grow up, and where do you live now? I'm born and raised in Sacramento. I was born to my mother, who was single parent, and to my um, and to my brother as well. Um, well, to my two brothers. I have. I grew up in. I grew up in Sacramento. I grew up in a in a house that was lived, uh, 40th Avenue, and around the uh, Stockton. I believe around the Fruit Ridge area. If my memory my memory serves me correct. Now I'm living with my brother in the arcade in the arcade area. How old is your brother? He, I believe, is in his mid thirties. Okay. Um, where do you currently attend college, and what do you study? I am attending the College of Sacramento City of Sacramento City College, and I'm currently majoring in history. Um, so, can you tell me about how you identify with regard to your social identities, broadly speaking? So, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, ability, religion, and so on. Well, I am Mexican American. I identify. My family was born in. My mother is also Mexican American as well. My both of my grandparents are from my, are from the town of Mercedes, of Cameron County, and the Rio Grande in the Rio, Rio Grande Valley of Texas. Their parents came from the came from the northern beaches of Mexico. Both my great grandmothers are from Monterrey, Nuevo León. My grandmother's mother was from the Ciudad Victoria. And my grand and my grandfather's father, my great grandfather, he was born on a ranch in the town of in the pueblo of San Marcos in Tamaulipas. They left all of them left Mexico during the time of the Mexican Revolution of 1910. Established themselves in tech in the town in Texas in the town of Mercedes in Cameron County. They met each other working in the fields, and they. Met, and once my grandparents were born, both my grandfather and grandmother being born and born in 30, 1932 and 35, they fought, they grew up together and grew up during the Depression era. More grew up in the Depression era. My grand after my grandfather became orphaned of his mother and his father became um, a single parent. My grandmother's mother uh, looked out for my grandfather and his father so that way they would be all right and. They grew up, as I said, they grew up together, and eventually they became from childhood sweethearts. They wed, they did wed young, and they together they had their family. And with my cousins, my grandfather's eldest siblings, they followed up. They they went with him following the crops, and until they established themselves here around in California in the town of King City, around if I'm correct, maybe fifty three or fifty four. My grandfather told my grandmother that he wanted to establish himself. He wanted to set roots down here so that way his children could have a better chance of an education than the one that he did. Both of them, being the second eldest siblings, left the fields, well, had to leave school to work in the fields to help their parents earn money to feed the, the younger siblings. 
I come from, and because of that, I have I carry their roots and what I know of their history with me, which is why I which is why I study so much with regarding to history, whether it is Mexican history or or history of the Depression or World War II or the Sixties or so. But that's because my family lived through that time. They witnessed that era, and so they those eras, and so that is why I make sure that I learn as much as I can, so that way and try to, and I want to see about learning more about my family, so she said so we it can be passed on to future generations as well. I come from a Catholic background family, and I have very I have great um, spiritual faith in my beliefs, but I do not also follow behind the. Uh, but I do not stand behind what the Catholic Church believes and whether it's regarding women's bodies rights or the topic of, of person sexuality because I myself identifying as bisexual, how would I be able to cast hate upon my own community if I myself identify as a member? I mean, as a part of it. It's, it, but it's hypocritical when one does. I, at the age of, when I was in kindergarten, my teacher noticed that I was, my teacher, her name was Miss Shaw. She noticed that there was something very different about me. That I was very different from the other children. I wouldn't listen. I when she said the playtime was over, I would go right back to playing. I would keep doing the repetitive movement. She saw that I was very sensitive to noise. I at times cried. I cried a lot during kindergarten. I was bullied during that time as well. I didn't make that many friends during kindergarten. I was at times bullied, or that kids would pull on the back of my collars to try and choke on me. And eventually, she she told my mother that noticing the signs that she said that to go get me diagnosed as a doctor because she believed that I had the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. When my mother took me to go be evaluated by the doctor, she the doctor concluded the evaluation. She said that your son does have autism spectrum disorder. This came to a shock to my mother and my brothers because most of them did it because they didn't know what was going to be what my life was going to be like. My mother did some further researching on the subject and she saw that people with autism don't laugh, they don't, well, they don't smile, they don't express emotions, they don't have any imagination or creativity. My brother, of uh, course, my oldest one, said that he, that it was absurd because one, I had a, a very creative mind as a child during that time. I laughed and I smiled a lot and at times I just walk around with, you know, happy in my own world without even the, without, you know, notice, noticing that many of my environment around me, much less the, what was the times like during the period of the, during the time of the 2000s. Now, in today's world, it is seen as an era, and I think to myself, great, now I feel much more older than I do. Uh, let's see. My, so, from what I've been able to tell you, I am, I identify as he, him, his, I'm on the spectrum, I'm bisexual, and I'm Mexican-American. In other words, saying Chicago. Okay, thank you. And so, how long have you known that you're bisexual? When I was, I had, I was in the closet during my time when I was in middle school. I, um, I felt, you know, I had a girlfriend during that time, and of course, we were pressured, peer pressured amongst our peers to try and um, to, because we hung around a lot. They peer pressured us and to just get together. So we did, and we went. I. We became, you know, part. We ended up becoming a relationship. Uh, I was, of course, um, my, I did as many things as a boyfriend do. I would take, I baked her, I baked her treats when it was, I believe, her birthday or during a time when it, it was during the winter season. I um, we had a scavenger hunt that we needed to do for our English and history. Uh, uh, it was an English and history. Uh, what was the program called? Well, it was a, the GATE program. It was for our GATE English and History class. That, the GATE class was only reserved to those who had who were very had very high scores on their grades. So after we finished the scavenger hunt, going to all different places, my mother drove us to a uh, Golden Corral. We ate and we we took. I treated her to that, and so we took her back home. I met her. I met her grandfather, and my and I told him. And I made sure to get her back by the time that I did, well, that her curfew was. But during that time of middle school, it was a, it was a hard period for me. My family was going through 
a lot of things during going during that time. My grandmother was my grandmother was going in and out of hospitals, and so she was either my, at home or she would have time to be in the hospital in Salinas because of one in King City. The pe the uh, the hospital in King City people go there only to die because there's because of how poorly staffed it is, and with it being in an agricultural town, it's not surprising that it would end up being that way. So the best bet was to take her to the hospital in the next town over. So what, that's what we did, and we got her checked out and everything. And during that time, my niece was born, and also we find out that my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer. She had been, they, she had had many problems with regards to her stomach, and they always said that oh, the doctors would tell her she's pregnant, or she was she, she was pregnant, or that she had, and that it was just indigestion, and so. And it was not until further, and, and she always kept on saying that by the time that they ended up, by the time they finally find out what's wrong with me, say, I'm going to end up having cancer. Because she had lost her mother, and great, her mother and her sister, my aunt, my great aunt, to, can, to lung cancer, both of them. But now, um, but, so that was happening during my middle, my middle school time, and I... The feelings kept festering, thinking that, oh, it's probably just a phase, I even waste my, you know, by at times, um, with how I felt about guys, um, whether it was my, when, when, that I felt about guys during that time, and, I went, and, but, by the time I got here, I, by the time I got to the college, it was my first year here, and I was taking the, my English class, and I was taking it with this one, there's this one classmate that stood out to me, and his name was um, his name was Raúl um, Raúl Sanchez, and he um, in my English class he uh, told me that don't go to college because I because we all went around during um, that class asked because the teacher asked us what is your purpose for being here in college what is it and I said the purpose for it being here in college is that. I'm the youngest sibling. I am the youngest of three boys. I'm the first of my, and also of the first generation of grandchildren in my family to have graduated from high school and grad, and also going to college. And they said that it was, and after I shared with that, he stood, he stood behind, well, he stayed back to talk to me. And he said that, don't go to college only for your, only for your family. Go to it for, you should go to college for yourself because you're the only one who's taking these tests. You're the only one that's studying. You're the only one that's doing the work. He told me that when he called his mom in the morning, she was crying because she's because her youngest son was going to be a college student again. From there, we talked a little bit more. I I start after that. I had a feeling in my stomach that I never felt before. I thought it probably might have been indigestion or something, but it wasn't. And at times he would come and speak to me after class, and we would, of course, um, we would of course talk amongst us. We would talk a lot, and we eventually traded numbers. And I started to develop feelings for Raúl. He was very kind to me. I every time I looked in his direction, he would smile at me, and I'd smile back. And I kind of had some sort of a I had a crush on him, and we talked a lot with each other. Well, we talked somewhat with each other, and we, uh, I found, I said that he was, we both were the youngest siblings, so we had something in common. He was, we were both called Wero when we were younger, because when I was a baby, I had very, I had very white skin, and like I had black hair. Well, of course, I had my black hair, but it was straight back then. Now it's curly. And when I had, um, and after I met, and of course I started to develop feelings, and my mother could see it as well, and well, she she noticed it somewhat, yes. And then I was on a Zoom call with him when we were trying to finish up an assignment for our, for our English class, and we thought that the due date was changed to later, but it wasn't, so me and him had to finish it up and wrap it and get it together, and then I asked him, like, oh, 
I noticed that he had a company in his room, and he he said, "Oh," and I said, "Well, who is that?" And he, and he said, "It was my girlfriend." So I ended up finding out that he was he ended up telling me that that was his girlfriend, and they've been together for ten years. And I had felt I had to go. I ended up going numb afterwards, and I thought. I'm not going to wait around for him to break up with her, nor am I going to try to ruin his happiness either, because he said that they had been together since 2015, and they were very happy. I was at the time 18, and he was, I believe, I, and I believe he was 29 or so, so it, it wasn't going to work out. It wasn't going to be like one of those, like, it wasn't going to be like the show Heartstopper, where Nick and Charlie, where Charlie ends up from my, was Nick, where Nick ends up starting to develop feelings for Charlie while he's still in the closet. It wasn't going to be like one of those books. So I ended up seeing him having to rechange the way I saw him and just saw him as a friend. We, he, uh, we did keep in touch with the last time I saw him. It was the end of our, his, our English class and then afterwards I never saw him again. And text him one day and I didn't hear from him so I decided to just delete his number. Hmm. So that was the end of Raul Sanchez. Well, that was the end of how I had felt for him. But I deeply had a realization inside myself that I had a feeling for both for guys and for girls and then comes around, then it was a new semester it was the spring, I believe, and I was chasing after uh, three guys. The second one was second one was was a guy named Javier. Um, he was a he had he was a Span he only spoke Spanish, and I had a hard time with speaking some English. So I of course um, not help. I was of course helping him, and we traded numbers. So his name was Javier. Um, he was, of course, a span. He only spoke Spanish, and I, of course, had a. And when he did speak English, he had a. He rolled it with a very charming accent, and then, of course, started developing feelings too fast, and then he ended up dropping out of the class. And when I emailed or texted him, I never heard back from him. So, let that one go. Then came another guy. His name was. Um, Let's see, his name was, uh, good lord, what was his name? I believe it was, um, oh, David. It was, his name was David, and uh, he was taller than me, and he had a very nice, uh, very nice um, satchel to him, and I liked uh, the way, and, you know, we just traded numbers one time, and of course I didn't develop things for him, we just traded numbers, and just, I thought to see how it would go. And didn't turn out, then he ended up ghosting me, so that ended up happening. And so I ended up deleting his email and just forgot about him. Then the last one that caused for me to actually come out was his name was, his name was Leonardo Rojas. Leonardo. He was the, I, I went to hang out with him. Well, he was the la he was the other guy in my English class, and I, my, I had liked him. He we hung around a lot at the library and also the cafe. Well, you know, just he would hang out there, so I would figure I would join up with him to hang out there, and so I did so. And during the spring break, I asked him if it would be okay if we were to hang out. He said we could, and we did. Hanging out one day, he, we went to the we went to the mall and walked around, checked out stores. Every time I tried to walk close to him, though, he would walk away faster from me, and it was like he in some sort of way like showing like he wasn't wanting to like for us to like be seen together in that type of way. And he took drove me back to my house. Um, of course, he drove me back to my. He drove me back. He said, "I'll see you later." I said, "So the same here." And we, and that was the last time I saw him as well. He ended up dropping out of the class. I texted him if he was coming. He never did. So 
he ended up um, ghosting me as well. When during that time I had reconnected with an old friend from middle school, her name was Miriam, and Miriam was uh, um, we. She had originally hung out with this with the group of friends that I had during middle school. The, both of them, that group for which caused me to have anxiety and trying to like, I was trying, I was a peacekeeper of the friend group. So I was trying to get everyone to, you know, get along together and sing Kumbaya. But then fortunately, that was a waste of time and effort. So and when they told me that they were angry at all of each other, I said, oh, what? And I said, that's the way you all feel. Then, pues, que le vaya bien. I hope you go, I hope it all goes well. That's my grandfather would say. But she, I called her afterwards and told her that, you know, this is the, I do, she did a reading on, she wasn't, she knew about Tarot, so she did a um, Tarot reading on him and he, she saw that he had red flags across the board and that the first person that he gets into a relationship with will cheat on him. Of course, um, I told her, Miriam, that I wasn't, I wasn't going to be the first one that was going to cheat on him because... When I find, when I said to someone I'm loyal, I wouldn't do that to a person of cheating on them, not after what my mother had told, has taught me and my grandparents have taught me about being, hearing friends who have been, or friends, children who have been either scorned or cursed in love and relationships. I told myself I wasn't going to be that type of person. So I told her that and she's read me and she said that I had I had some green flags, so I decided it's not worth the use and to just leave them be. I then afterwards told my mother about what about the terror about what Miriam had did, and my mother said, "Okay, Thomas, I need to get this headache out of out of the way. Do you like girls?" And we had one of our talks where we talk about life and what she has seen, what she has lived through, what she has survived through, and then, and that usually takes around like four hours or five or six at the latest of us talking. But eventually I told her that, but of course I also told her, I also was able to get my feedback in because I wasn't gonna just let her do all the talking. And I told her that it was that I was, um, I came out to be bisexual. And she said, well, that doesn't change anything. So my son, still love you. And you know, when, I, when you do find someone, you do bring him to the house or her. But I know you, you want to save up. But I know him. He will be welcomed here with all. He will be very well welcomed. Of course, she had told me that after when I went to go hang out with, with Leo, he and she took a picture when I was walking out. He said that he sh that she saw her taking a picture of his license plate. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, oh, this is just great, mom. <laughs> you sure you would you not like to see about his social security or 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 his parents um or his parents land to deed to any land because he was he was Mexican, so and so he was Mexican and so was so was Javier, so was Raúl and. The last, um, the last guy that I had tried to, that I had chased, his name was, uh, let's, his name was, um, Tobias. I met him on the, I met him on, um, Instagram Live. We were seeing an Instagram Live. I was commenting back on him. I was commenting on his, and I introduced myself to him. We talked a little bit. Afterwards, we traded numbers. I shared a picture of myself. He shared a picture of him. And we, so we both saw each other. But afterwards, um, he ended up ghosting me or forgetting that my messages were there. I left a voicemail sounding immediately desperate. And it was something that I... It was something that I still at times cringe to myself about, and I ended up letting him go. I deleted his number, I unfollowed him. It was my, I had, it was another, another failed chance, or well, failed shot, if I would say. 
So um, your mom knows that you're bisexual and she's supportive of you. Do you find that she somewhat overprotective sometimes? Yes, she is because of what the experiences that she has gone through. Um, she is also the youngest sibling and she's just wanting, and because of me also being on the spectrum, she is just wanting to make sure that I don't end up getting, she doesn't want me to see about getting hurt or she still kind of sees me as like the kindergartner. Mm. But I have, at a young age, I had to, uh, in the classroom I grew up in, it was uh, not a good environment for an, a child on the spectrum, and there being kids who were just wild and, wild, and they were at times jerks as well. Same goes, children can be cruel. That was that. And I... This and with them being wild and acting out in the classroom, I told took upon myself to not be like them, and I was the one that had to be the mature one, the one that would actually be listening and be respectful to the teacher because they didn't have respect, they didn't have no respect. And so, I put myself to learn how, so I found myself to be the respectful one, the one student that the teacher wouldn't have problems with. Of course, that. Of course, some kids saw that and they alienated me at times from at, sitting on lunch with them. And I, one time the principal called, called the whole class out on it and said that that was not right for them to do that. And for that, I'll be forever grateful of Mr. Cedric Reagan. So do you think that's why your mom is overprotective because of these experiences that you had when you were younger? Well, she is protective of our children in general because, I mean, uh, my, my oldest and second brother, she's not so much, but with me the most because she's seen like the struggles that I've gone through and the, the bad days I always had in that school. It's the school, by second, first and second grade, things got, started to get a little bit better, but just once third and fourth grade hit, it, it took a whole wide other turn to where I could not, to where I felt that, the, and to where the kids were, the classrooms were shrinking, com combination classes, teachers were leaving left and right because of the new principal that came in. The new principal that came in, she um, she would just not even discipline the kids or like tell or call them out on what they're on the crap they were pulling. She would just say, Okay, just go do your job and go back to class. That was all she did. And but so she didn't have like the she didn't have the authority to at least help to tell us student that look, you're supposed to come, you come to class, you're supposed, you come to learn. You're not, you don't come to act a fool and be, and be causing arguments among your peers or even getting into fights at the latest. So because of that, I am because of that and she, oh, one time her and one, one time, my mother and the friend of and the mother of my ex um, best friend, they both went down to go speak to the to speak to the principal about this classroom situation, and and then the principal then came to check up on me afterwards to see how I was doing, and so it was like, and then of course before my mother left, she came and popped in at me at lunch, and she as and she told me, don't worry, I'm not banned from the campus. And I said, good, that's good, mom, because. That's myself. That's good because I'm not walking home or taking the bus. Um, so, do you think your experiences, um, at, you know, coming out as bisexual and having um, crushes on guys, has that been shaped at all by? Has your experience been shaped at all by being autistic? Do you think? Well, I never did. Just to Raul, I I told him that I was and. To the others, I cannot remember if I had did tell them, but with my with my experience, I have learned that um, I had this one. I had this friend that um, he told me to not to that regardless of me being autistic or not, it should not. I should not let my disability. Um, well, don't to not be ashamed of it and. Being on the spectrum, it is somewhat of a challenge because when you do reveal that to, to certain people, 
um, people can easy, might not want to take the risk of having of interacting with you because they because of the because of all the of all the um, stereotypes and misinformation about what it is to be like on the spectrum and when they hear that they may think oh I don't wanna they could be a handful or it, they could be someone that is um, it could be too much to handle and I have unfortunately have lost some friends from that well not from that but from certain experiences recently lost one who was a major who I believe was a major part of my um, of uh, my life um, we were friends for we were almost going to be friends for a year and we ended up um, things were said well I let my were I did not think twice before I spoke and I ended up losing him and it's been tough it has been tough to get over or at least try to live with this pain because you can't get over a pain when it comes to losing someone I'm I lost my grandfather before the middle of the pandemic before the pandemic came and it's something that me and my mother my mother says she'll never be able to she was left traumatized when she saw him have a heart attack in front of her. And I had told her that I cannot live with the memory, with that just being the main memory that I have of my grandfather. When I speak of him, I have that pain when I do. I'd rather speak with him when, when, I'm, when I speak of him. I'd rather, when I do, it makes me feel happy and, feel, and not feel sad or feel like I'm on the verge of crying and it is hard to find um, people who will be okay who won't see you as someone who is weird or someone that could be too much or also won't call you the R word either because I did hear that fairly amount in the school that I grew up in and it and you know, it's and not directly to me, but I did hear it a lot around my growing up, and it's like it's a word that you shouldn't be that shouldn't be used. So, but I believe that with my me being on the spectrum and also being bisexual, I see it as something that is a part of me because with the goals that I have for my career, I feel like I will be able to at least be. I hope that I'll be able to be someone that people whether they're kids or they're teens or, you know, just anyone in general can look up to and see that, that when they see me, they see someone that they can relate to. They, they can understand that, w that even though, or that even, or even certain situations or certain experiences or certain things about my background or my family's background that I've gone through, it can somewhat relate to people to where we can at least talk regardless of our differences. So do you think, you're primarily a student at Sac City College, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that the college has provided adequate support and accommodations for you as somebody who's autistic? I believe that the college could do a better job. I, I understand that there, is a, there are many campus students here, but I, when I was growing up in my, in my middle and high school, throughout my middle and high school career, I had um, caseworkers from well, um, IEP counselors that help that would hold the annual IEP meetings with my mother, speak with my teachers, gather notes on what they can do, on what I can improve on, on my behavior, and in growing up in <clears throat> excuse me, growing up in the elementary school, I had through I had um, coordinators, I had well aides that helped me keep focus in the classroom and. Help me with understanding my homework. Help me with, you know, at least having, uh, at least with having, a interest in school. Because in kindergarten, I barely had one. And in, but come first grade, I started to somewhat develop one. But sitting down to get my homework was, at times, a fight with my mom. So it was a lot. It was a lot what I had gone through at that age, and so. I feel that now I'm having instead of having my IEP counselor like come in and check on me, see like how you doing, what's up, and so forth. I I now have to I now have to go and find the support 
for my step for my count with the counselors here and at times they may not be available and at times their their only availability is like three months out and i have to at times figure stuff out on my own or seek help from from other places that's why i'm very grateful for the Rasa center and how they've been able to help me the main counselor um the main count the main student counselor she has been the um, one of the amazing people that has been able to help me like give me help to where the Rasa Center has made me feel like it's my second plate, my second home, to where I can be able to go and be there and just be myself and I have to worry about responsibilities or what needs to be done. I mean, yes, they, it, they help me with my homework or when it comes to signing up for classes or my financial aid, but there I'm just able to like relax and just hang out with, with people that are among my age and also among my my quote among my background with regards to my ethnicity so it's good and i'm also able to talk to him about stuff regarding queer topics because they're all they don't hold no prejudice towards them but i feel that the college could do better by at least having more counselors from dsps to have more dsps counselors so that way students aren't having to wait months out to meet with a counselor that's what i feel like they could do better what about in the classroom faculty? Is there anything you'd like to see faculty do a bit better to um, support you as an autistic student specifically? Well, this last semester I did have one teacher that was, um, I had my Spanish teacher. Uh, she was a real piece of work um, because she was very strict in our class. And it, when at times I tried to at least talk, ask her for help for two times, she would get frustrated with me and I said, okay, and she said, okay, Thomas, and, and, and Don says, yes, I'll go and say this, and then I would think to myself, you know what? I thought to myself, what's the point of me asking you a question if you're just going to end up getting frustrated with me? And if she would have, if she would have lost her temper with me, I would have told her, look, I've had my, I've had enough, I have enough years growing up in elementary school to where my third grade teacher left me with trauma, had left me with trauma when, for yelling at me and leaving me emotionally hurt. And mentally hurt and and also growing up in the elementary school that I did grow up in where I had to always be on the defense or always have my guard up I'm not gonna have it continue in my college classroom I would have told her I'm an adult so are you and I've give I've done I believe I've done my best to give you my respect but if you're gonna be doing this but if you're not gonna be respectful at least be understanding that look I have my I I have my accommodations that were sent to you by the disabled services department here at this here at this campus. And if you're gonna be, you know, like starting to get frustrated with me, I'm thinking then what's the point of me even what's the point of me even attending your class if you're just gonna be this way to your students? And if that's the case, then I believe that you should probably put in your work or put in your papers to retire, because if you're not gonna have them this patient with students, how are you how can you call yourself a professor if you yourself do not have the patience? to much to try and to try and under and speak with them so do you feel like a faculty could use more training on how to serve you know autistic students and definitely disabled students yeah no regardless of being on a spectrum um regardless whether it is being on the spectrum or with add or adhd those types of disabilities i believe that they that other students i believe that teachers and well the college faculty could use a profession in, my, in how to at least try to be a little bit more patient or a little bit understanding with regards to people who are on the spectrum. I think it's kind of, it's rare for a faculty to have any training at all in how to, you know, how to teach neurodivergent students, disabled students more generally. So it's often up to faculty individually to figure that out. So. Exactly. There probably should be more institutional support, don't you think? That's another thing as well. Yeah. So do you feel empowered in all of your identities as Mexican-American, as autistic, as now bisexual? How do you feel in your identities? Before, when I was a younger, when I was young, I didn't speak that much Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a hard time to communicate with my grandparents who were native Spanish, who were native Spanish speakers. So... After I, my grandmother passed away in freshman year of high school to a stroke, even though she had um, been diagnosed with stage four liver cancer, we never told her how long she had. 
but and we gave her this tea that helped her and the doctor predicted six months we knew she lived she was able to live a year she had her appetite come back to her she ate thanksgiving dinner amongst all amongst everyone and come christmas time she was making tamales that's one of our traditions that we do in our family to is one of the traditions in our family is to make tamales and she was right there making them along with us and and after she had passed away, I put myself to learn how to speak Spanish because my grandpa was left alone in the house in King City. So I made sure to put myself to learn Spanish by watching videos, repeating what they were saying, what listening to music. And it was my grandfather who introduced me to Mexican movies. We would sit down. We He started showing me the movies of of this one ranchera singer that I love still. So his name was Antonio Aguilar. Well, he was, his name was Antonio Aguilar. He passed away, I believe around 2000 or so. And his wife and, and his wife, Flor Silvestre, who passed away in 2021 or 22. But I watched their movies and they, and most of Antonio Aguilar's movies were regarding um, people from the revolution and, and not the people that not from the Mexican Revolution but not the people that you see in the in the Amer in the American uh, history books that are issued out to the to the elementary students or the, to the elementary schools or the high schools or middle schools even no the, he played the people that have he played the people that um, corridos are made about and not the corridos that now you hear days are sung by Peso Pluma or, or sung by some guy who sung like a crow being put to a meat grinder then you hear a bunch of cl uh, clarinets just blasting away like a, like if they were like train whistles that have their um, that are stuffed up no the the corridos that are at least sung that are sung by mariachi and the and he played those people in the movies, I could name one right off the bat, Valentin de la Sierra, or Domingo Corrales, or even the El Ojo de Vidrio, The Glass Eye. Um, so he, he, so he played those. He played those men in my, during that time, and he well from that era, and he made those movies and showed and showed the people of Mexico. Oh, and. Me when I sat down to this with my grandfather, it was it was our thing to sit down and watch those movies of him. But after my grandfather passed away, um, I didn't watch that much of the movies of Antonio Aguilar because we would watch them after a weekend out on the weekends when after we would after either doing or either helping do the yard because he was the one because my grandpa grandfather who had a green thumb big green thumb could grow anything and he um he taught me how to cut grass he taught me how to pull weeds from to and stuff like that so he taught me my how, a lot about my taking care of plants and how and how to mow lawn the correct way you know i always had a struggle with it because i couldn't understand them but now that i put myself to watch those movies with him and seeing those like the charros and the haciendas and but also seeing the struggle that the poor people the peones the peons suffered through i it gave me you know it i saw it and you know i my i i didn't think that uh it's injustice well even though it wasn't just what they went through but it just showed me you know like this is what this is what i come from these are my roots and after he died um, well, also during that time, I also put myself to also watch movies of Maria Felix. She was this great, she was, imagine Marilyn Monroe and Elizabeth Taylor mold into one, but with more of a strong attitude. Well, more of a strong-willed attitude and iron head is what I can best put it at. That is who she was. And she, like, all her movies, she either played either the femme fatale, the gold digger, or even that's in she even did some movies of the Mexican Revolution. Her major one was called Juana Gaia, where she played a woman um, named um, she played a woman named Juana Gaia, Jane Rooster, and who led an army of men against the the, the, gov the Mexican government, the federales, and. To make a movie about a woman 
and you know and empower a moving a movie empowering of an empowering woman commanded the forces of men and during that time with the men having their machista in them it but and for her to having and for her having to play a woman who did exist and led uh, many charges and successful battles against the against the <clears throat> the soldiers of the of Huerta's army it shows that it represents you know the people it represents Mexico in that even women were able to had the strength in them to to fight in arms to fight for the people la república mexicana and and for the liberty and freedom of the of their people against the blood sucking rich and powerful who are corrupt and because of him showing, because of my grandfather showing, at least introducing me to the movies of the, uh, the Ranchera movies, it gave me, it opened me up to a whole new world, to of where I, to where I looked up films that uh, from the black and white era of Mexico, where they were black and white, and seeing those movies and like and how they act, they represented a Mexico that no longer exists, a Mexico that is now. You, it's played with drugs, corruption, femicides, and but now, but and there was an interview that um, Maria Felix did a long time ago, where she said, where she had said, prepare yourselves. To, she said to to all you men, prepare yourselves because the the uh, the rebellion of the women of the woman is coming, and to women, abuse, educate yourselves, complain, but educate yourselves read complain but you but you are the only ones that are in charge of your destiny so and because of her saying that now we're seeing a change in mexico to where people are now fighting for to where women are now protesting to the femicides and saying where is and doing things whether establishing networks or creating or creating hot um, lifelines or um, apps as well to make sure that they know to help uh, make sure that their daughters or cousins or mothers and and aunts don't end up going missing or end up being found, but they're found life without life, and and some in some cases that does that is what happens to them, and all they want to do is just find their is find their daughters, their nieces, so. Or any women of their family and kin, and just give them a proper a proper burial and resting. And because of that, because of that sad reality that now exists in Mexico, I my, my, I look at these films and see that this is the Mexico that those films of that era of those songs of Jorge Negrete singing Mexico lindo y querido are. A portrait of the past and no longer exists because now we see a Mexico that um, still has its corruption, still has its abuse, still has its missing women and or that are being killed and that are being killed and are being um, and are not being able to be found. That's the Mexico that unfortunately exists. And with regards to me being on the spectrum. I believe that my I never I didn't have a good understanding of what it was like to be on the spectrum. I just I just call I would just call myself autistic, but until I further grew up and further learned about it, I realized that this is something that does that I do actually that I learned more about my condition. I don't see it as a disease. I don't see it as a sickness. I don't Yes, I have my struggles with with my symptom with the symptoms that come from my from my disability, but I don't suffer from it. And there are people that that are basing my my condition off of vaccinations, or they're basing it off of old of of Puritan ideology of behind of Puritan ideology of the old, of old dominionism that. Says that my condition comes from the devil.
when actually it doesn't. And even in my culture, even in my culture, they they uh, well, they see a child on the spectrum. They say that oh, the uh, niños travieso or están quietos or or is something like that. And where in fact that it, they're not, they have something that is, they have a condition that causes them to retain information differently and cause them to look and it causes you, it causes them to look at the world through a different view because that is what my autism is, is because you retain the information differently, but you also see the world and you analyze things a lot more differently than anyone else can. Can I, um, I kind of, is it okay if I interrupt? I want to ask you about your class status. Um, or if you wanted yeah. to say anything else before moving to that point, but I haven't asked you about that at all yet. So, but um, well, with regards to my class status, I, I mean, I don't feel like I've ever been stepped on by someone who was rich. At times, I, though, at times I have felt jealous. Well, I did at times feel pea green jealous one time of my boss's son. Um, Cause I, you know, I told my, he doesn't help his father in his business. He doesn't help his father in his business. And, my, and one time he did come to help. We told him to go throw away the recycle, the cardboard. He broke it down, left it on the cart, but never threw it away. Me and my friend, me and my friend uh, Marisol, we saw that and I and we thought, what? And we thought, what the hell? It's like, dude, I mean, you, it's like you had something so important to where you left this for us to finish. But that's the way he was raised, and I. Of course, he has never pulled out the fact of his, when I did work with him that one time washing dishes, he never pulled out that one fact of him saying that my, my dad's your boss and you gotta listen to me because and that I would have replied, so you know what son, your dad signed my check, but he doesn't own, he doesn't own me. I my, am independent. I don't have a property tag placed on me anywhere. So I'm, and your dad, of all the dishwashers that have come in and out of this restaurant, I've been the only one that's lasted longer than any of them. And I've made sure that when dishes are clean, they come out clean. And I have never in my whole, and yes, you, he, he, is, he has a golden spoon fed to him. He doesn't have to worry about he doesn't have to worry about bills or has to worry about earning a living. He consented to live off of his parents. Of course, he never pointed that out. He, luckily, he. I'm glad that he never, you know, used his class rank on me. But it's just I did feel insecure because of how he has so much time to, what to go to school and also dedicate him, his time to the gym since he likes. It's obvious he has. The, a better physique than me. I uh, did feel insecure about that, and I told and my friend my soul. She told me we worked together in the kitchen. She said, "Don't ever feel insecure about that, Thomas. It's my you should not feel insecure about him because he is just a mama's boy. He's a mama's boy, and he lives off of his mom's money. You, you at least are independent. You, he doesn't have to worry about you. Have more responsibilities than him, but also." Look at what you have been able to complete. Passing your statistics class and being autistic, that is a major accomplishment for you. So don't you feel insecure just because he's over here, just because of him, well, because of what he looks like. He is a, bit, he is a hot shit. That's what she told me. So how many, you work as a dishwasher at a restaurant, how many hours a week do you work? Well, I work part-time on the weekends from eight to three. Um, my, I work, I've been there for almost two years now, and we have had, um, I have these last two, there was these two last dishwashers that really put me through the ring. They were, both their names were Judas and Moses, and both of them, the mo Judas the most persecuted me to kingdom come. She, I told her that I tried to best explain to her in Spanish that I have autism and that I come from sensitivity and noise because she would throw the dishes into the sink. 
the metal containers or plates or metal plates, she would throw them into the sink. She didn't care. She decided to use that as to her advantage and make intentionally bully me on that. And her brother would follow along with her. Kitchen manager stuck up for them the most. Kitchen manager stuck up for them the most and he was over here and my, of course, me and my friend Marisol, we never, it always, we never would, it wouldn't surprise us if there, if there would have been more than, than employees going on, than an employee status going on between the two of them. It wouldn't have surprised me because her and her brother would a ask me one time about my religion. Then her brother ends up wailing into my religion, disrespecting it, and he said, and him being Jehovah Witness, I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not crapping on your religion, so don't come crapping on mine. So I told him that. Then one time they asked me if I was single or had a girlfriend. I said no, and then they asked me if I was from the other world. The other world meaning if I was gay. And I said no, and first of all, if I were, I'm, I support people who are. But I don't, I, but I'm not gay. I never did. Were you actually, did you know that you were bisexual at the time? That you said you weren't gay? I was, I, it was during, it was after I had come out. It was like already a good while after I had come out. But at my work, I am not open. I'm only open to certain people about my sexuality. The kitchen manager, I'm not. To most of the kitchen staff, I'm not. Because I know that they'll either use my sexuality as a way to discriminate upon me or they will not want to work with me because the cook, the line cook, she has a old dominion ideology and old school way of thinking to where she might want me to not to give things to her from my hand. And I, of course, am, and, but to three members of the kitchen I am open to. To my friend Marisol, my co-worker um, Porfiria, and my co-worker Gart. I'm open to both all three of them. And they support me and and they support me and they care for me no matter. Okay, I'd like to talk some about uh, life at SEC. So have you um, taken courses that either wholly or at least in part focus on queer or trans topics? I took the, I took a human, re, this last semester I took in a human lifespan class with the professor, um, my, with my, uh, my professor who identified as um, being, um, being homosexual and he, we would do, we did a one time a chapter response saying what did, what defines a person's sexuality or gender and I talked about it a fair share, and during the I talk, we talked about it fairly, and he, but he would always, you know, share about his point of how what he had gone through being a gay man during before it was, and the times where it wasn't accepted, and and how there was a lot of he saw a lot of his friends either go through go through the AIDS wards and aid wards and. It was a lot of seeing, it was a lot for him seeing that happen. And he shared with, he asked us, you know, and I gave my point of view saying, you know, how I'm bisexual and that I know that I'm secure. I feel like I'm somewhat secure with my identity and know that I, and it's okay how I am, not, and we talked about it fairly and how unfortunately in today's climate there's a lot of hate being delivered towards trans people and gay people but most of all trans people who are human beings at the end of the day there is this one saying that i heard that if you cut if if you cut my arm and i cut if i cut my arm and you cut your arm we'll, we will be the same color of bloody red because that's the end of the day that's what they are they're human beings they get up they go to work they get up, they get dressed just like the rest of us. They either go to work, go to school, or or just try to survive throughout the day. That's the way all of us do. But they have to survive. But they have to do more to survive for themselves. Because they never know when their day could come.
That's an unfortunate sad reality that we live in. And with regards, and during the film, during my film class of spring, last spring semester, uh, there was this one I shared about my identity. Well, I got a chance to share a lot about my, uh, my identity since I identify being Mexican-American, being on the spectrum, and being bisexual when we talk about those, those three film groups. Well, those groups represented on film, I was able to give my point of view on all, on all three of them. And my, when I shared about my sexual orientation, I shared that, you know, I, how, what I went through with chasing after those guys and what I, and there was this one, at one point I said that, look, all I ask, if you can't understand me, if you can't, if you can't understand me, my nuts, if you can't understand me, or if you can't accept the way I live, that's fine, but all I ask is you don't hurt. That's all I ask, because there are some people who, some people who are very stuck in their ways, very stuck with their ideology to where they, to where people like me aren't accepted and we're, and we're seen as a devil. But there are some people that, or just bait, or just of old prejudice, hate that can accept people like me, and I, and if they can't accept me, what's the, what the hell am I going to be doing, wasting my time trying to get them to accept me for me? It's at the end of the day, it's a waste of time. As long as I'm secure with my identity, as long as I accept who I am, that's all that should matter. Besides, there's people that don't even accept Mexican people who, and we exist. This whole, hell, look at the states that we are not a part of this country. They were all of territories a part of Mexico before the, before the War of 1837, or I don't think it was 1837, but it was around the 1800s that the war broke out between the, between the U.S. and Mexico. 18, this, 1846. Yeah. 1846 is when the war broke out. So when, they, when the war broke out in 1846, this is all, this California was one of the territories that was a part of Mexico. So, and yet there's some people who have the ideology that, you know, Mexicans shouldn't exist, but yet we do. We live in cities. We live in towns. We, we are, well, we are universal people, and we will exist till the end of our day. Have you, uh, have you been in any classes that actually talk about uh, queer Mexican Americans or queer Latinx people? We did. Men there was a, We have at times met. There was at times mentioned. Uh, well, I at times mentioned Chavela Vargas, who was a le open les who was a lesbian ranchera singer, one of the very first one. And we at times talked about either Frida Kahlo, well, I, uh, Frida Kahlo and her being identifying as bisexual and how the lovers that she had, we, there was at times that, I believe in my film classes when we talked about her. And did you bring it up or did the professor bring it up? I brought it up. And also, I also mentioned of this one actress from the Mexican Golden Era. Her name was Sara Garcia. She was dubbed the uh, the grandma of the of cinema because in all the movies she played in, she either played the grandmother, the mother, the mother-in-law, or the energetic grandmother who who took no nonsense and was uh, cigar smoking, pistol whipping, tequila uh, tequila drinking, um, fight feisty lady who was tough as wet leather. That's, she played that grandmother in the movie Los Tres Garcia, the Three Garcias, and I mentioned to my film, to the film professor who came to speak to us, um, who was a faculty member in the, sta uh, the staff, I told them that about Miss Garcia and how she had a closet, she was actually a lesbian and had a lover named Rosario, and she is, if you were to go to the Mexican Isles, if you were to go to the Lati well, Latina Isles in your supermarket and you see the grandma on the hot chocolate, that is who she was. And there was a myth going around in the in the Sinaloa that she had taken her teeth out to get to she had took her teeth out and broke her knee just to get the role of grandmothers. But those those rumors have been either have been either seen as you know observed or ignored or like even there was the one actress that helped her you know get started in the cinema. Her name was Emma Roldan. She said an actress doesn't have much. So, so in your history classes that you've taken, have you ever been taught anything about queer or trans history or specifically about Latinx queer history? Mm, never. 
we've never been talked about during the time that um, when we were in my film class, we talked about me about um, indigenous people. I met I brought up the be um, the Mushis, who were who are two spirited people and well, who are two spirited people and how they they live in one of the towns. Like don't I don't know which town in which state they live in, but they had a whole documentary made about them and it's shown on um, HBO. Well, now it's called Max. Before it was called HBO Max, but now it's called Max. So you're not the first student to say when queer topics are brought up in the class, I'm the one. I felt, are they, students have felt like they have had to be in a place to teach other people about like what it means to be queer, what it means to be trans, or just about queerness in general in their society. Yeah, and at times also mentioning history that is not even, that, and also bringing up history topics that are not even mentioned in our books. I, one time, uh, this last, the last history tech, the last history class that I took with my um, professor, um, I mentioned about this town um, called El Nacimiento de los Negros, and how it was a town that was established by slaves who escaped to Mexico. They they were escaped slaves from Texas that went to Mexico because in 1821 Mexico won the independence from Spain, abolished slavery, but then came the establishment of the of the hacienda system, but. They came to Mexico to search for freedom. When the Future Safe Law was passed, I told my Mexico refused to sign it because they believed in that when they stepped on Mexican soil, they had the right to freedom, independence, and the right to freedom, independence, and liberty. And many, and of course, that town there is not that much of an Afro Mexican population as there was, but now. And the towns of Oaxaca and Guerrero, that's where my coworker Porfiria, she is from. She uh, said uh, she is from that town, and if you were to look at her, you can see that she has the ancestry mix of, of uh, the ancestry mix of Afro Mexican within her. And when I t and when I taught told my teacher about this town, I also mentioned that they're they're the same town that also celebrates Juneteenth. So, are there any faculty? that you've appreciated in particular for whatever reason that you've connected with, that you've just sort of appreciated how they teach? Oh yes, I've appreciated, know? I've been able to, I appreciated my film teacher that I had, mm -hmm. I appreciated my history teacher, the mm -hmm. other film professor here, um, that the other film professor that is here, I have, I very much appreciate them. They identify with they, them pronouns and I appreciate, have appreciated my, um, the faculty of the Raza Center who have made, um, who have made me feel like I have a place that I ha can be able to have a place of home with them. And I am by any other, but by the teachers that I can be able to bring up right now, those are the ones I feel like I've had much of a, of appreciation and connection with. Do you feel like you've connected, you mentioned the Rasa Center, do you feel like you've connected in particular with um, Latinx faculty and staff? Definitely, because I'm among, because in that center, I'm, that center shows the unity of the, of, but it's also shared with the Ashe Center, so I see the unity between, uh, between the black students and Latina students and how, we, you know, even this art there that shows unity among our, between both our people and but being able, but mostly with the with the Rasa Center, I, I converse with them, I counsel with them, and they, and you know, with them we, I've been able to connect a lot with, and I've found to be, I've found to where they, the Rasa Center has been like a second home for me. Are you involved in the Puente program? I'm not involved. I ha I enlisted late into the semester the first time, so I never got the chance to sign up for the point for to be a puentista. Mm -hmm. Are you sad about that? Uh, somewhat. I would have liked to at least connect with other students, but I did sign up for the Indies program when the, my first year here, and with them I connected. I met many students who I established. What meant many students? I connected the most with the professor, and uh, one student in particular. Her name was. Um, my name was Natalia. She I connect. She was one of the main Rasas, and she was she. Her family is from Guerrero, and her I've connected with the uh, most because she was very um, because she was very nice, and with all the time that she was there, it was she made the um, she was very helpful to me, and oh. she ended up graduating. So oh. she ended up graduating. So I said my goodbyes, and I said I hopefully I'll see you when I do. 
What was that program called again? The Indies program. What was that? What's that? Um, basic introduction to it's an like an HCD course. Oh. Um. So, if you had the opportunity, would you be interested in taking a course that focuses on queer and trans topics? I would, mm -hmm. because there's so much. There is so much about the community that I have yet to learn about because there's certain stuff like I can't. And there's certain gender like genders and how they use the pronouns is hard for me at times because. Growing up, you know, the pronouns were he, him, his, she, her, hers. Now, there's people identifying with they, them, this, or other pronouns that I can't think of right off the top of my head, and so many different gender identities that, that I never thought of, or think that, oh, they were just something that's brand new, but no, they've existed, but it's just been shut out. And if I had the chance to, I would like to take that course so that I can learn more about it, so that way I'm willing, so that way... I stay informed and not live in, in insecurity. And so if you had your choice, what um, what what queer-focused class would you want to take? Like, would it be history, literature, queer studies? I believe history and studies would be a good one. Because mm -hmm. I would, history I have a love for, mm -hmm. and studies would be maybe if it shows the different identities and, pronoun and how to use pronouns, I feel like it would be very informal and help me to where it would help educate me. Because that's one thing that my that my coworker Profita she tells me that you know you you're a very educated person, my a very educated young man. You don't you're not like these other my people here that I that work. My you have more education than the bosses even. Mm -hmm. You have like you study, you learn, and from and from you I've learned a lot. So from and my, my, because of that you are. You are very educated. You are very, very educated, my, my man. So you mentioned that you were involved in the QSA. Can you talk a little bit about more about that? What's the QSA and how did you get involved? The Queer Shared Alliance Club was founded, was re-chaptered into the school by my friend. Um, her, her name is um, Renee. Lenny? Uh, no, Renee. Not Lenny. Is it okay uh, if I mention her? Oh, sorry. Yes, it's fine. <laughs> so, so let's see. Renee, she was very um, well. I can't remember what pronouns Renee started using, but I'll just go off of Renee. So, Renee, I connected w through Miriam, the friend that I had that warned me about the last guy that I chased. No, the fourth guy that I chased. So, with Renee, I learned. Um, she, uh, Renee, told me that they, uh, they were wanting to restart. The QSA with the Queer Shared Alliance Club. That is a club that helps. That is that is offered to people who identify with the LGBTQIA plus, and also a club to where any people, whether they're allies or just curious to learn more to interact with people who are among who are part of the community. It gives them. It would create a space to where they people queer or trans or or just a part of the community can be able to interact with one another, interact with one another, converse, talk about whether what they're what they're going through or what experiences they have gone through or even their coming out stories as well. Which at times can either be heartfelt and at times can either can either be heartfelt and end with good endings or be unfortunately sad and end with bad endings. But that is the meaning of the QSA to try and establish a sense of unity, a sense of of, of community, a sense of uh, a sense of community and un and unity among the among students to where they don't to where they can be able to allow themselves they can allow themselves to be free and not have to fear about the prejudices that they have that they face in outside of this campus or even at times within this campus but it's never seen or it's never talked about and the role that I played in the QSA is I helped my friend Renee actually restart the club I helped uh, Renee start the club and with Renee having not a good uh, time not being very um, social well not so much social but very open to public speaking I myself I took it upon myself to go up to the mic spoke in English and in Spanish and talked about the QSA, went around passing out flyers and it was something that I enjoyed. 
But unfortunately, during my, this last semester, I was so busy. I took, I was taking my Spanish class and taking, taking my Spanish class, and also um, busy with assignments and how the semester was a wild roller coaster for me. I didn't get that much chance to be a part of the QSA. I was just. I was unfortunately didn't get that much time to, I did not get to spend that much time with um, the club, but it is, but I'm very glad that it is now rechartered and that it is, hopefully it will grow to where it will, even after my friend graduates, it will still be a part, it will still be a part of this campus and hopefully it will be left in good hands to where it will, to where this club will be a, some serve as a haven for students a part of the community to to where they can come together and feel a sense of unity instead of division instead of instead of division or or the feeling to be closeted or not be so expressant of themselves is the qsa fairly racially diverse yes it is because there are different from what i was able to see we saw i there was a member who is of Poly, i believe a polynesian background uh, Af um, African American background, um, Caucasian background, and uh, Asian um, Asian background as well, and me of uh, Mexican American background as well. So, but like I said, I wasn't able to participate that much in being a part of the club, like how I wish. But it does it does have a very unique diversity among it. So have you had any experiences on campus feeling harassed or discriminated against because of your um, bisexuality or your other identities? I feel like I have not. I feel like I haven't had faced any trouble okay. with my with the staff or with students. No. Is there anything that you can think of um, that the campus could do better to serve queer and trans students in particular? Maybe. Maybe this could be one that could be a little bit taboo, but maybe have a place, maybe, well, I know that the, the LGBTQA plus center has a stand that gives out um, uh, protection for um, intercourse. Maybe, a, maybe if the campus were to establish, uh, I don't know if the clinic has it, but maybe to where they, they can get free to where HIV testing can be given or ma SCD or HIV testing can be given because if they are not able to have access to proper transportation or even have the chance to like or are closeted among their family and if they need to go get tested this campus should probably can the campus clinic can probably serve as a good place to can help those students during, and, not, and not just during the semester but also not, but also during the during the break, vacate during the off seasons as well, because not all because if they're coming here to take summer classes or just come here or do want to come here, they should have the they should be given the chance to. So that way they are well aware of their sexual health. They are well aware of what they are well aware of of themselves, and I feel like that could serve as a good as some as a good uh, practice for students here and also show to not also be ashamed of wanting to be responsible for your sexual health because what is now with unfortunately now with monkeypox and now in and now with monkeypox existing it is something that scares me personally because i myself am not sexually active at all but I know that if I were to have friends that were to catch it, my they themselves would be frightened. They would be scared of what's going to happen to them. And if clinics, if there is at least just a clinic or a nurse here that can help to prevent that or tell them where or help them, you know, my diagnose them on where they are in their sexual health, it could pop, it would serve, it, that information could help serve them to where they know what steps to take next. And the other thing I feel like could help serve this, the college better is if there were to be classes that could be offered not only not only hybrid, but also in person or through Zoom. And it would, so that way students can have 
So that way students who are identifying a part of the community can have classes that, that will be interesting for them and so where they will want to and to where it will to where even high school students who identify a part of the community will see that will see that this campus has it and it will cause them to do and will cause a drive in masses of students of the community to come and take and come to this college to take these class to take these classes so that way it so that way they it, I don't know if it will give them a feeling of being I finally being accepted or finally have a feeling to where school isn't going to be boring but it's going to be interesting and it will teach me something more about myself. So um, what excites you, very general question, but what excites you most about being a college student? What excites me the most of being about of being a college student is the chance of getting a career. I am, like I said before, I am the first person in my family to have graduated from high school. I'm the first person in my family to have gone to go to college, stay in co and actually have lasted in college this long. I, you know, doing what my family, what other people in my family weren't able to or get or had the opportunity to. And just earning my career is something that will help me and also is something that I look forward to as a college student. Plus being in a campus, look, go, interacting with students or, and also the extra, and also the financial aid that is offered to students helps a lot because some of us don't earn a lot to pay bills and working minimum wage. So the, min so the financial help that is offered here, at, that is offered here at this campus is the one thing that I look forward to because it serves a lot coming from someone who is of the working class. So do you have any financial stress right now that you think sometimes interferes with your, um, you know, your, your status as a student? Currently not. And I don't, and at times I, and if the problems were to come, I wouldn't let it affect my studies because my, from here is where I can be able to find the help that I need. Whether it's the whether it's emergency grants, whether it's whether it's uh, filling out uh, applications for scholarships, or this is where I can order turn to when I need the help. So somebody who's first generation um, and first generation college student and working class, do you ever have trouble navigating college and being a college student? At times I do because being either. You know, uh, being on a spectrum, you need to have establishment of a routine, and I at times don't have one, and I get disorganized, and I at times sh have struggled um, with my classes, but towards the end, I've been able to make up for it, whether it's getting an assignments last minute, or my, talking with my teachers about certain situations that have been so far been very understandable, thanks to the helpful written at professor.com, um, that has helped me to choose up excuse me, um, professors that have actually been very helpful. And so I feel that my, but from a struggle, just the need of organization is what I've somewhat struggled with, but I've been up, but luckily I've been able to still keep my head afloat and not have the need to drop out of college, which I don't plan to anytime soon. So anything else at all you want to elaborate on or, or mention that you haven't gotten a chance to talk about? We only have a couple more minutes. <clears throat> um, maybe there is this one next thing. I don't know if this will serve as any help, but coming from someone who has identified with three minority groups, being Mexican American, being on the spectrum and being bisexual, you you're gonna face your challenges. Whether it is in the workplace, whether it's your own personal mental health and or certain situations, whether losing a friend or going through a, a sudden a change in your environment, it's I know that people you know, people, you hear this on the internet or you see these messages, but 
don't let it's gonna be you're gonna have dark days that you face I faced mine plenty and as long as you have the support group of your friends as long as you have the people that have cared about you and your life don't take them for granted if they need help you help them the best you can if, as they have helped you when you needed someone to lean on and talk to with with any, whether it's whatever that you're facing make sure that you also might count them make sure you count them as the important people in your life and but what I can also say to any people who are young and to any of my fellow young members of the community don't go chasing for guys who for anyone who won't give you the two cents of a day because it's not worth it it's not worth it and it doesn't do anything to help you as long as you feel that you are accepting of yourself and okay with how you feel of your mental uh, whether it's your appearance whether it's your identity whether whatever as long as you feel okay with yourself that is the now you are okay with yourself and you accept yourself who you are you and that's all that should matter because you shouldn't let other some random people define you don't let random people define you or these people that are in power don't let them define you or pre, or launch prejudices prejudiceness upon you you stand up to them the best you can and you show them that you have a voice you know how to use it and regardless of where, where your ethnic background, regardless of your social background, regardless of, of your gender or your sexuality, but most of all in today's country, in today's climate, your sexuality and gender, don't let them be defined or destroyed by someone who doesn't who doesn't have sympathy for for or respect for human life. Don't let them. You are the ones who are, you show that you have a voice. You show them that you know how to use it, educate yourself, read, and, and most of all, stand up for yourself.